Walaikum Salaam So we were talking about Walaikum Salaam We are inshallah going to discuss, as you said, uh, one of the biggest misconceptions uh, among non-Muslims related to uh, human rights. People say that Muslims do not respect human rights. While the statement is partially true, there are some Muslims who do not respect human rights. Islam as a rule, Islam as a religion can never be blamed for the actions of some bad Muslims. Yes? Clear? So, Islam is a rule and order. Anybody who does not follow, or all, any Muslims who does not follow the rule and the order, he's not necessarily a good Muslim. So, inshallah, I will be comparing today between the articles of the United Nations, the articles of human rights issued by the United Nations in 1948 by another declaration of human rights issued or revealed by God Almighty 1400 years ago, and that is the Quran. And according to that research, we found that, alhamdulillah, we discovered that 100%, 100% of the articles in the United Nations related to human rights are found completely in the Quran. All the 30 articles, and these articles are online. You can download them and you can read them. Human rights, according to the United Nations, issued uh, 1948. You can download them and compare them with the Quran. Of course, due to time, you know, uh, limitation, we will not go to all the 30 articles. It's a huge uh, research. If I talk about each article two minutes, that's already one hour. And we don't have that much time, so I will pick up the most important articles that are in accordance or, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call that? The articles that are matching with the verses in the Quran, we pick up them, and you will be surprised to find that there are few other articles in the Quran, or few other human rights in the Quran, do not even exist in the Human Rights Declaration according to the United Nations. This is one of the amazing things uh, discovered during the, in, in this uh, uh, research. And also another thing is that you will find that some of these human rights which are identified by the United Nations in Islam are not only human rights but an obligation. It's an obligation of every Muslim, not barely a human rights. Such as, for example, one of the most important concepts in Islam is justice. Justice. You know, we hear all the, uh, this famous phrase or this famous saying, justice for, justice for all. Yes? So what Islam has to stay with uh, uh, on justice? Justice in Islam is the ultimate goal of Sharia. The Islamic Sharia or the Islamic goal came into existence through the Quran and the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad to establish justice. Not only that, but the main purpose of sending prophets and messengers to, any, to all other nations is to establish justice. Listen to the words of Allah, God Almighty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, we send a four time our messengers with clear signs and send down with them the book, the Quran or the revelations and the balance of right and wrong. Why? So that people may stand firm or stand forth in justice. So the main goal, the main purpose of sending messengers is to establish justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another place say, O you who believe, Ya ladina amanu, stand out firmly for justice. Stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though it, it may be against your uh, parents, yourselves, your parents, or your relatives. So, subhanAllah, God Almighty is telling us, we have to be just, even if it is against your own relatives. Sometimes when my daughter do mistakes, or when our loved ones do mistakes, we just let go. You know, we forgive easily. But in Islam, justice has to be done, even if it is against your own relatives. And I cannot, I cannot find a better example than the example of Omar ibn Khattab, one of the greatest companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. When he was the leader, when he was the leader of the believers, that is 
years after the demise of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he assigned Amr ibn al-As, another great companion of the Prophet Muhammad to be the leader or the, uh, the king or the president of Egypt at that time. He was the ruler of Egypt. His son, the son of Amr ibn al-As, was having a, a race game with a Christian friend or a Christian neighbor in Egypt. They had race. And the Christian won the race. Then what happened? The son of Amr ibn al-As became a little bit arrogant and beat him up. He beat him. And he told him, how dare you? How could you win over the son of the noble people? So the Christian became, you know, saddened and he took the matter seriously and he traveled all the way from Egypt to the city of Medina. Why? To complain to Omar ibn Khattab. He went to Omar ibn Khattab, the leader of all Muslims everywhere at that time. And he told him what happened. Then immediately Omar ibn Khattab, who was known for his, for his justice, he called quickly, immediately, for Amr ibn Aas, the ruler of Egypt, and his son to be brought to Medina. Bring them quickly. And then he started hearing from all sides, and the boy, the, the, the son of Amr ibn Aas, he confessed. He said, yes, I beat him, and yes, I told him, how could you win the, uh, over the son of noble people? You know, the son of Amr ibn Aas, the companion of the Prophet. So Amr ibn Khattab ordered the Christian man to be the son of Amr ibn uh, al-As in the same way. Beat him as you were beaten. And then he looked at Amr ibn al-As, a great companion of the Prophet. And they are very close friends, Amr ibn Khattab and Amr ibn al-As. He told him, tell me Amr, when did we start to enslave people? Tell me. How did you raise your son in this way? To show arrogance or to, to act in this way towards others? And these others are who? Christians, not people of our religion. So you see how justice is to be done? No religion or no any standards to be put forth on the Muslim leader to judge between uh, people except by the truth and justice as found in the Quran, even if it's against your own people. This generation of the Muslims were amazing. They were not, they looked upon themselves as the liberators. Liberators of human beings, not as killers and people who enslave people, no. So as we said earlier, we could be comparing between human rights, declaration of the United Nations, and human rights as found in the Quran. So what is article number one according to the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights? It says, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed, endowed with reason and conscience and they should act towards one another in the spirit of brotherhood. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said 1,400 years ago, Ya, Ya Ayyuhannas, all mankind, we have created you from a single pair of a male and female and made you into nations and tribes so that you may know one another. Inna akramakum and Allahi atqaw. For most surely the most honored amongst you is he who has the most level of taqwa or God uh, consciousness. So here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us 1400 years ago that everybody is equal. Whether he's uh, white or black, Chinese or Filipino, Egyptian or uh, what else do we have? What are Indians. Whatever. Inna akramakum and Allahi atqaw. The most honored in the sight of Allah is who? The Arabs. The Arabs? No. Chinese maybe. The most honored in the sight of Allah are those who are having the most level of taqwa or God conscious, uh, consciousness. Freedom of thought and freedom of religion. It is mentioned in also the Human Rights Declaration of the United Nations and it says that everyone has the right to freedom of thought conscious and religion everyone has the right what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran kill them say that convert them when you see them take the sword and tell them if you don't become a Muslim I'll chop off your head no Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran let there be no compulsion in religion just deliver the message and let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open the hearts of the people if he wills and this verse 
was revealed for a reason. لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرجل من الغيب that there is no compulsion in religion. Truth will stand firm. Truth will always stand in a clear way. What was the occasion? The occasion was that that before the advent of Islam, there were some people, idolaters, who always bore children who are females. And back then they hated females and they used to kill them, they used to bury them away. <coughs> and so they made vows to Allah, to God Almighty, that if you grant us males, we will make them Jews. We will convert them or we will make them Jewish. And it happens afterwards, there were a generation of idolaters whose son are Jewish, uh, Jewish, practicing Judaism. It happens. After the advent of Islam, some of those parents converted to Islam. They became Muslims and then they started to force their own sons to become Muslims. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to defend those Jews, they say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, let there be no compulsion in religion. In another word, verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, and had your Lord will, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to, those on earth would have believed entirely, all of them. Then, O oh Muhammad, would you compel the people in order that they become believers? Will you compel them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reasoning with the Prophet <coughs> In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, uh, the believers, men and, uh, this is the second part of the declaration form of the Declaration of the United Nations in the same article which continues that this right includes freedom uh, uh, wait a minute, either alone ta -ta 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 -ta, manifest, oh ok, we will skip this part alright ok, freedom of thought or freedom of expression or freedom of speech in Islam has a great space to such an extent that at certain time you can even argue and can even express your thoughts and feelings with God Himself. Imagine you standing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking Him and questioning Him. We can see that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to create a human being before the creation of Adam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa that I am making on earth a Khalifa, someone who will inherit this earth, a human being, Adam and Eve. So the angel questioned Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will you make on earth those who make mischief and shed blood while we glorify you and thank you and praise you? Will you make another creature who will come and make a mischief on earth? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't punish them for that. He said, inni a'lamu. I know what you don't know. And he started telling Adam, tell them the names to show how Adam is superior in knowledge than them. Then they say, Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alamtana inna ka'ata wa'ayin wa hakim. Glory be to you. We have no knowledge except what you have told us. So in Islam, you can even have the freedom of speech with Allah Himself. We can see that also in the example of Moses, peace be upon him. Moses, peace be upon him, was not afraid to request from God to see him. Moses wants to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah didn't punish him for that. Moses said, Oh my Lord, show me yourself so that I may look upon you. Allah said, You cannot see me, but look upon this mountain. If the mountain stands still in its place, then you shall see me. Now, what happened? The mountain, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed himself to the mountain, what happened? The mountain and Musa fall down, you know, from the greatness that he has seen, and he lost uh, consciousness. You see, but he didn't, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't punish Moses for such question. Abraham, peace be upon him, also he said, Oh Allah, show me how do you, you know, create life and cause death. Show me, show me a, a sign, show me a miracle, how do you cause things to happen, how you create life and cause people to die. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't punish Abraham, he told him, Oh Abraham, didn't you believe in me until now? He said, no, I do believe, 
but I want it to strengthen my faith. I want my faith to grow stronger by seeing something, you know, in front of my eyes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again didn't punish him. No, he told him, okay, bring some birds and cut them into pieces and put each piece on the mountains and ask them to come to you. And they will come flying quickly to you. This is how I, I create life and cause death. The Prophet Muhammad also told us that the best types of martyrs, those who die for the cause of Allah, is the one who was killed by a tyrant for criticizing his tyranny in his presence. You go to the ruler, like the people in Egypt, the people in Tunisia, the people in Libya, who finally, alhamdulillah, spoke out and started to criticize the, 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 the injustice that has been happening for years. Those people are the best, according to the Prophet Muhammad Why? Because they spoke a word of truth to who? To a tyrant, a tyrant ruler. Not only behind his back, in front of his face. And because of that, they were killed for that cause. The Prophet Muhammad also said, if the time comes that you see my nation, the Muslims, are afraid, are afraid of telling a tyrant that he is a tyrant, then there is no hope in them. Forget about this nation. There is no uprising for them. They will remain weak. <laughs> As Sheikh Yusuf Estes, when he was here a few years ago, uh, he said, I just saw the tape a few days ago actually about, he was talking about uh, family uh, in Islam, something like that. And then he made a, a very funny comment. He said that Muslims are the first to surrender, not to Allah, but to the enemy, to the Israeli. We raise up our hand quickly. <laughs> So the above, what we have mentioned now, proves to you what? It proves that there are plenty of rooms for freedom of expression in Islam. Not only that, but freedom of expression in Islam is limitless. It's limitless. It has no limit. You can express your feeling, you can express your desire, your, your ideas without any fear according to Islam. And there are plenty of examples in the history where people came to argue with the Prophet Muhammad to, and he compromised all the time. Mostly, he used to compromise for the sake of, uh, you know, spreading the message of What else do we have in the human rights uh, issued by the United Nations? For example, enjoying what is lawful. It says everyone has a right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, medical care, etc. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, who has forbidden the beautiful gifts of Allah, which He has produced for His servants, and the thing clean and pure which He has provided for sustenance, say, they are in the life of this world uh, for those who believe and purely for Him, for them on the day of judgment. <coughs> Thus do we explain the signs in details for those who understand. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that all the provision that He has given and He has placed on earth are for whom? For the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I said earlier, there are 30 articles of human rights declared by the United Nations. We cannot go through all of them, but the research is open for those people who can make the study. No, let us let us do it together. I have collected actually through Dr. Uh, brother uh, Father Suleiman. This topic, he collected some verses, I, I added some verses, and let us do the same. Let us increase until we complete the 30. Uh, but the research is being made. We didn't just include them in my in our talk. What else do we have? Marriage and procreation. Article number 16 of the United Nations Human Rights it says that men and women of full age without any limitation due to race nationality or religion have the right to marry and found a family. What the Quran says 1,400 years ago, and among his signs is this, that he created for you mates from amongst yourselves, that you may dwell in tranquility with them, and he has put love and mercy in your heart, and this is are the signs of Allah for those who reflect. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that amongst his signs, amongst his miracles, is that he created male and female and bring them together in tranquility, in marriage. And he put into their hearts love, not only love, I love you, I love you too, I love you three, I love these three. <laughs> not only, I love you, 
carries with it mercy. So love normally comes from the side of woman. You know, women are, and they say in Egypt that the love of the woman is her life. It's all her life. And the love of the man is half his life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> woman, when, <laughs> when woman when women love, they they really love. I mean they give their entire life for uh, her man. But when a man loves, he loves also, but he likes also football, he likes also his friends, you know, you know he favored many things over his wife sometimes. This is the nature. Uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put love for the woman and mercy for man. So the man should always be merciful to his wife. And there is no greater example than our Khattab again, who once was, one, uh, one person went to complain to our Khattab. He went to his home. Why? Because his wife always shouted at him. You know, men are sometimes weak, <laughs> like me. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, we cannot say no to our wives. You know? We always have to follow. Because, but anyway, so this man is, is very angry at his wife, so, but he cannot do anything on his own, so he went to Omar al Khattab. And Omar al Khattab was known for his bravery, for his, you know, uh, strength and power and courage. He was amazing. He used to walk in the markets beating the people because they are blocking the ways. And everybody when you see Omar, just don't approach. Even Shaitan, Satan himself, when, when Omar used to walk in one path, Satan used to take another path. Imagine how strong Omar was. So this man went to Omar, knocking the door, but before he knocked the door, he heard something inside. What he heard? Can anybody guess? Can anybody? Yeah, he heard his wife <laughs> shouting at Omar. And Omar is not doing anything. He's not reacting. So the man gave up. <laughs> so he went, you know, back. What can we do? I came to ask Omar to save me from the trouble at home. But I find him the same like me, you know. <laughs> so Omar Khattab opened the door uh, as if he was going out. So he saw the man walking away. So he told him, man, I'm so sorry for that. Okay, okay, leave it, leave it. Leave it. Yes. I'm sorry. So he told the man, it seems that you came for something and now you're going. He said, yeah, I was coming for, you know, to tell you about my, but no problem. I mean, you know, I was coming to tell you that my wife is doing something bad, but I found that. And the man was like shy, you know. <laughs> so our Khattab understood and then he started telling him that she bear with me when I was angry, you know, and she prepared food with me when I'm hungry. And when I removed my clothes dirty, she gave me a So shall I not wait and bear with her sometimes when she's also angry? Allah, that's, that's Islam. You know, in Arabia, when I was in Egypt, I thought, or I was brought up in a culture that man is a man, you know? He must shout, he must order his wife to do things. And if the wife shouts at him at some times, that's uh, horrible, you know? <laughs> yeah, how could you do that? How dare you? But I found that the, the greatest people in history, in Islamic history, they bear with their wives. The Prophet Muhammad used to clean the floor with the, with the wife, he used to milk his goat, he used to mend his shoes. The greatest of all human beings. And we are arrogant and acting, you know, foolishly towards our wife sometimes. But alhamdulillah that we are learning so that we can apply the learning. Now, we talked about the marriage. What about divorce? What about divorce? Divorce is not to be found in the 30 articles of the United Nations for human rights. You have no right to divorce your wife or you have no right to divorce your husband, according to the United Nations. Imagine. Really? There is no article that says that men and women or husbands and wives yes. whose relationship is you know cannot work they should divorce they should separate in peace and tranquility same as they got married in peace and tranquility with love and mercy then if marriage doesn't work for any reason they should separate also otherwise we will find somebody is throwing the other from the window <laughs> but divorce is mentioned as a right which was given 1,400 years ago. And by the way, the reason why the United Nations doesn't include divorce in their articles is because 70% of the United Nations customers who pay the salary 
the, the religion says that there, there should be no divorce. So they compromise. They compromise and they say that you don't have right to get divorced. They didn't include anything about divorce. SubhanAllah. In Islam, a whole chapter was revealed in the Quran about talaq, about divorce. What are the rights of the woman that she would get after the divorce, in case of any divorce? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, the divorce is twice. You may divorce once and then we go back together, inshallah, we uh, bring them together, don't do that, try to, and they come again, and then if you divorce again, then the third time is terrible. So after that, either you retain her on reasonable terms, or release her with kindness. Even in separation, you must be kind to her. And it is not lawful for you men to take back from your wives any of your dowry. Because in Islam, one of the conditions of marriage is to give dowry. To give amount of money, agreeable amount of money to the to the wife only. To do whatever she wishes uh, with, with this amount. So it's not allowed for you to take that back, which you have given them. Except when both parties fear that they would be, uh, would be enabled to keep the limits ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So divorce is explained, uh, and also another, uh, in another verse it says, And Allah has made for you maids and companions from yourselves, and made for you out of them sons and daughters and grandchildren, and this is related to procreation of the same article. Let's go to one of the most important articles also in the Human uh, Rights Declaration of the United Nations is, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of a person. Everyone has to live, has the right to life. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, this is article number three. The right to live in Islam, not only to human beings in general, like how uh, the United Nations indicates, but even to children. The right to life, even for children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and kill not your children for fear of poverty. We can see in China, for example, I have witnessed this in China, that people go and you know discourage the baby or uh, abort the baby because they are poor or they don't have the means to support their children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, do not kill your children for fear of poverty. We shall provide for them as we have provided for you. Who have provided for you in the same place? So leave them, leave them to come to life. Allah will, will find a way for them as he has found a uh, way for you before that. Because surely, the killing of them is a great sin. If you kill your children for this reason of poverty or something, it's a great sin. Again, another uh, verse that it was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ during the days of ignorance when the Arabs used to bury their daughters alive, he said that on the day of judgment, those female infants will ask, will question, for what crime we have been killed? Those infants, when they, when they will be resurrected once again, they will question what crime have we done to be in order to be buried or in order to be killed. As killing other people, other than children, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and do not kill anyone whose who's killing Allah has forbidden. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbid killing any innocent people except for a just cause. If there is a just cause to be carried by the government, then there is no blame. But you don't carry the judgment yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says again in the Quran, on, the, on their account, on the account of the Jews, we have ordained for the children of Israel that if anyone slew or if anyone kill a person, unless it is for murder or creating mischief on the earth, it is as if he has killed all humanity. If you kill one person without any just cause, it is considered in the sight of Allah as if you have killed an entire human being. And if you save one life, it is as if you have saved the entire humanity. Let's talk about Article 23. It says right to work and right to earn. It says that everyone has the right to work, free of choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work, to the protection against unemployment, etc. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that there is no sin on you if you seek the bounty of your Lord during pilgrimage. Even during pilgrimage, we are allowed to do business. We are going to do some acts of worship. One of the five pillars of Islam, or five acts of Islam, you may also seek some business during this trip of pilgrimage. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, it is He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has 
made the earth manageable for you, so walk in the path thereof and eat of his provision. Go and work. Some Muslims, sadly, I inspire. When they reach the age of 40 or 45, they make some money, they say, Alhamdulillah, finish. My job is done. I have enough money. Let's sit in the mosque and pray. All night, all day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, No, walk in the earth and keep uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's provision. What else? Ownership. Article number 17 of the UN uh, Human Rights it says everyone has the right to own property alone as well as the in association with other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, To men is allotted what they earn and to women what they earn. To men is allotted, allotted what they earn and to women is also so. In Islam you may work and earn and also own properties and this rights is given to, to women in a society which at that time women were considered to be a lower class human being. They were con not considered as equal with men. They used to be you know, uh, actually for the, for the pleasure of men. Women were created for the pleasure of men as the Arabs believed at that time. And in such time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them that woman is equal to you even in owning property. Imagine, 1,400 years ago. So let's talk about inheritance. Who can tell me when, when woman in Europe was granted the right of inheritance? Who can tell me the right of inheritance and the right to vote for their presidents in America? Who can tell me? How many years ago? Anybody knows? About 100 years ago? No. What no? 50, 60 years? So you are, you are more kind to them. <laughs> Inheritance in Islam was given together with the revelation of Quran to women as well. They used to inherit when their father died or when their husband died, they used to have shared. And again, the longest verse in the Quran, one of the longest verse, actually it's the biggest, the longest verse in the Quran is about inheritance. The share, how women should share. And until 1970s in Egypt, 1975 or 1976, around that uh, time, if a man dies and he left some you know, wealth, the government takes 48% of the share. The government used to inherit with the people. And it was not un uh, until the Sharia, the Islamic law, become the source of judgment in Islam, uh, in Egypt, this law was cancelled. Only after the Sharia interfered. Because according to Islamic Sharia, this is not the right thing. The Prophet Muhammad said, anything that a diseased, a dead person leaves behind, this belongs to his heirs. Belongs to his heirs alone. Article number 12, home privacy. How about in Europe? Maybe. Yeah, it's around the same thing. 100 years, 100 years. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy, family, home, or correspondence, nor to attack upon his honor and reputation. This according to article number 12. What the Quran says about the same matter, it says, all you who believe, enter not any house other than your own, until you ask permission. Don't just open the door and enter without permission. Enter with permission of, and do not enter until a permission is given. And if you are asked to go back, if somebody told you go back, then go back. Don't insist to enter, like some people. Um, I'm your friend, man, open the door. No, no, it's not a nice time. Come on, man, open for me, I'm your friend. If somebody told you go back, you should Go back about respect and honor and reputation. The Quran says, No believer man.